that a whistle stopped tour. Yeah. Um, well, thanks very much. Um, by the way, your discussion later on is fantastically interesting and quite timely because things are changing quite dramatically. Um, we, I, I want to do a round view of what is going on in every place. Just to say that in terms of Chile, things have been bad because there's been a setback to the constitutional process as a result of which the right wing was able to win the latest election to a constitutional council of 50 grandees that are going to produce the text, the new text, which is going to be presented to a referendum. And two thirds of those, if not more than that, are actually pro Pinochet people. So that is very bad. Um, so I suppose the final democratization of Chile will have to wait a little bit and there will be the need for more struggles to go through in order to get that sorted. Although there is no guarantee that the new text is going to be approved, there is certainly you know, a major setback for the progress, progressive proposals that were made before and the social outbreak that took place some time ago. In Peru, we have the same situation with the stagnation of the fight against a de facto dictatorship, parliamentary dictatorship there. Um, but Latin America, the rest of the Latin American presidents are rallying around carefully to ensure that they help. But I think the most important thing I want to concentrate today on is on the summit that President Lula called on the 31st of May to take place in Brasilia, the capital city of Brazil, where he invited all the presidents of, the, of South America, not of all Latin America, only South America. We have North America, which includes Mexico, Central America, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and then South America. South America, there are 13 countries, 12 presidents attended, one did not. Dina Boluarte from Peru was not authorized by the right wing in parliament to attend. But somebody else then attended on her behalf. What was the most important event of the, the most important element of this was the fact that Lula, um, side by side with President Maduro, who was the star guest to the event, relaunched regional integration of South America, which is extraordinarily important. Um, of the all presidents who attended, the most important thing was the framework that President Lula presented to the meeting. He said, first of all, because we suffered setbacks in the past, that is to say right-wing governments coming to office or could that, then the regional integration process was stopped, stalled. We need to relaunch it. And this time around, we're going to launch it by thinking very carefully about having some kind of regional single currency, not like the Euro, but it's a different kind of currency. I don't have time to uh, give details because it is technically and it will take too long. But nevertheless, the idea behind it is not to depend on engaging in transactions in their mutual commerce on the dollar. That, he made that totally explicit. That is to say the whole region, if this were to work, uh, will move away from the dollar, which is you know, part and parcel of the process of de-dollarization that is going on in the world, which is weakening the empire, the empire's ability to continue to use their economic muscle, which they don't have any longer, to pressurize countries, intervene, overthrow things, wage wars and so on, although it's still capable of a lot of damage. That was the most important thing. So the relaunching is going to actually have much more, much stronger basis. The plans are to set up some sort of Bank of the South, which was already a proposal made by Chavez a few years ago. And the strength of what Lula presented was the fervor, the intensity with which he presented it was unbelievable. I mean, Lula is a very eloquent speaker. I speak Portuguese myself. And I could tell, you know, how he was conveying this. Um, and then he moved very quickly to defend Maduro. 
In other words, Maduro is going to play, Maduro, the Venezuelan government, is going to play a central role, a pivotal role, in this new relaunching of the regional integration. And it makes sense. Um, in the region, in the sub-region, that is to say South, South America, Brazil is an industrial giant. Brazil is about the ninth or tenth most industrialized country in the world. So literally anything you want, you know, you can have it in Brazil. Any partnership you want to establish for your own development, industrial development, you can do it with, with Brazil. But Venezuela has the benefit of having the largest deposits of oil in the world. So if you put these two together, then you can see that this is a very strong alliance. And important, I mentioned to the alliance is Argentina. Argentina is an agricultural power in the region as well. So there you have all the ingredients of, you know, these countries actually coming together and moving ahead on this. Lula proceeded to defend Maduro and to defend Venezuelan democracy. And he, he was really strong. He used very strong words to actually refer to, particularly he criticized European social democrats. I think he meant all the Europeans, but he mentioned specifically the social democrats by saying, how is it possible that social democrats in Europe who are supposed to defend democracy actually do not accept that there is democracy in Venezuela where there have been more than 29 elections over the last 20 years? That's number one. And number two, he said, it's even worse. I'm sort of paraphrasing, not literally translating. Uh, he said it's even worse because how is it possible that all, not only they do not accept despite all the evidence that there is democracy in Venezuela, but even they are prepared to recognize an imposter, you know, why though, as the interim president of Venezuela says, this is a farce, it's completely unacceptable. So in other words, he projected President Maduro in a very leadership role in what is coming in now in Latin America. They organized a special conference, a special press conference, Maduro and Lula, where both of them actually put forward their views, which are very coincidental, uh, their views of, um, you know, what they, how they see um, the question of regional integration. So in other words, the relaunching is going to be very, very good. The key is to ensure that they continue collectively to fight against poverty, they continue collectively to fight against external intervention. They continue collectively to fight to improve the standard of living of their population. And they continue to fight together, work together in order to ensure that there is, you know, hospitals, health, free education, and so on. By the way, most of these countries, with the exception of Chile, and like civilized countries like the UK, have university education to deliver the university as free of charge which is, you know, it's exactly what you want in a continent like that. So what are the consequences? There are very, very important consequences I want to dwell very quickly. Number one, Lula in the various pronouncements that he made, made a sort of off the cuff suggestion that it would be a good idea perhaps if Venezuela were to join the BRICS, you know, and Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, these new emerging economies and international collaboration that is, is emerging very strongly. And Maduro said, I'm quite delighted to join right away. Next day, China and Russia publicly said, we will be delighted to accept Venezuela into the BRICS. That's a very important. But there is a more important dimension which has been, has been missed by the corporate media. The banks of the BRICS is called the New Development Bank. And it's a bank for development, for social and economic and infrastructural development. And it is called the New Development Bank. And Lula some time ago, I'm talking about a couple of months ago, proposed that the person who were to be appointed president of the New Development Bank is Dilma Rousseff, former female president of Brazil. And she is now appointed officially as the president. So Brazil is going to be the mechanism through which Latin America in this relaunching of the regional integration process is going to have access to some of those resources. 
and it's going to have that connection right away. Um, so you can imagine, this is extraordinarily important. Number one is a massive blow to US policy of trying to overthrow, demonize, uh, and punish Venezuela for the audacity of looking for an alternative path. So this is a serious blow to that objective. That's number one. Number two, it is a very important victory for multipolarity. You know, Latin America, Africa, and many other countries around the world, certainly in Asia, they want to move to a multipolar world and move away from a unipolar world where the United States uses the dollar, weaponizes the dollar, you know, against countries, uses war in order to stop multipolarity and uses sanctions, aggression, interventionism, and so on in order to continue to enjoy supremacy that it doesn't deserve to continue to have. So this is another important, quite important blow to the intentions of the United States, you know, to have um, to have a unipolar world with where they command. It is problematical in the following sense, oh, given that this is another blow to the supremacy of the United States, which is already severely weakened, then they're likely to continue to become even more aggressive than before. So expect the worst, although hope for the best. Nevertheless, in terms of Latin America, this consolidates quite substantially around Brazil, which is an industrial giant, which is a massive country, um, you know, the regional integration process, which is the only way in which Latin America is going to be able to actually defeat and destroy and overcome finally neoliberal policies, which are the main problem that we have. It's quite important, let me finish with this point. If you take the whole of the combined GDP of all the Latin American countries together, this is including Mexico all the way down, the totality of that is about $5 trillion, $6 trillion. Brazil GDP alone represents $1.6 trillion out of that total. So that gives you an idea of you know, how important it is to have Brazil on our side and how important it is to actually make an alliance with them. This means also that the possibility of dismantling Bolsonaro, fascist currents and so on has become substantially easier and it's going to be much better. And I worry about Europe. So we are thinking in Europe that perhaps what we need to do is to set up a solidarity campaign with the Europeans because they've been hit so badly and they don't seem to be able to defend themselves that well. I'll finish with that sarcasm. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francesca. Um, have anybody got any quick questions, Francesco, before we go on? I think it was very comprehensive what you said. So I'm not sure there are any questions that are really relevant, but if not, we'll move on. And I was just going to ask um, Francis King, who's one of the editors of the special issue, um, if you want to say a couple of words. Oh, yeah. Afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me all? Yeah, that's fine. It's good. Thank you, Francis. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say a few words about the oh, the Circus History Society and it, 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 its kind of track record in, in, in dealing with, 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 with uh, Caribbean labor history. And to sort of pay tribute to one of our former members who was the, uh, if you like, the, um, the main driving force in that, Richard Hart. Uh, because prior to doing this special issue on socialism in the uh, English speaking Caribbean, we published three of, uh, of Richard's pamphlets. The first one we did was about the labor rebellions of the 1930s in the uh, uh, British Caribbean region colonies. He then gave, wrote a very uh, enlightening and uh, interesting memoir of his time as uh, Attorney General uh, in Revolutionary Grenada before finally doing a, um, a, a survey of Caribbean workers' struggles overall. The first two pamphlets we published jointly with Caribbean Labour Solidarity. The final one we published jointly with Bogle Overture. And so this was, this was, if you like, the society's background in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in working on this and what kind of inspired well, me in the first instance to um, launch a call for papers on socialism in the English-speaking Caribbean. Because one thing that Richard's work really kind of brought out, I always thought, was the distinctiveness of 
the Caribbean socialist movement, the distinctiveness of that and that experience. It wasn't simply uh, a movement that was kind of brought in from uh, from outside, but one which was sort of in uh, grew up organically within within the different Caribbean societies. This was something which Richard really brought home uh, in in all the stuff we published, and what made it seem seem a sensible idea to. Uh, Try to explore this more with this call for papers, and we were very pleased um, with the response we got. We held in March uh, last year three uh, uh, consecutive seminars, uh, in which Ozzy and Ben and, and and several other people uh, gave papers, of which we then selected four, which seemed to be the most appropriate for for, for the journal. We we're very pleased with the way that. With the way that turned out and the uh, the, the um, cooperation we had with Caribbean Labour Solidarity throughout this uh, throughout this process. Um, so, yeah, we have plenty of copies of the what we ended up producing the journals on socialism in the English speaking Caribbean with uh, Aussie's uh, history of socialism in the English speaking Caribbean, uh, Ben's Black Power and Socialism in the West Indies as well as paper, uh, articles by Lorraine Thomas on politics and Caribbean literature, concentrating particularly on the literature of St. Vincent, and Anel Ethel's Bain's uh, study of the uh, problems faced by revolutionary Cuba, Nicaragua, uh, and Grenada uh, under the eagle's eye, the eagle being the United States uh, of America. So this is, the, uh, this is the stuff that we've been producing in the Socialist History Society. The journal, uh, as I said, is available and I'll, uh, within the UK, it can be, uh, you know, we, we can send it to you post free for uh, eight pounds. Uh, the other publications, the first two we did uh, about the labour struggles of the 1930s and uh, the um, uh, Richard's experience in Grenada are out of print, but they are available on our website. So you can download the, you can download the PDFs or download the text. Caribbean workers' struggles is also is also available for purchase, and I shall I shall I shall put the bank details in the chat if any if anyone's interested. Uh, that's all I've got to say. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Francis. Um, I've had a quick look at the at the um, publication. I think it's really impressive. Um, I'm now going to move on to the first speaker, um, which is Ozzy Warwick. Um, the Chief Education and Re uh, Research Officer at the Oilfields um, Trade Union. Um, Ozzy, you've got about 20 minutes. Um, I don't know how you're going to compress your really comprehensive article into that, but <laughs> luck. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, um, Nadine. Uh, so let me first thank Labour, uh, Caribbean Labour Solidarity for launching this important publication of the Socialist History Society's journal. And I would also like to thank Socialist History Society, uh, Francis, and they, their decision to really focus on the importance of the contribution of the English-speaking Caribbean to socialism. And I must say, I'm uh, trying to squeeze over 100 years of dynamic and rich history into 20 pages was very difficult. And I really have to thank the uh, Socialist History Society's editorial team, uh, Francis, Christian, Michael, uh, who helped make the impossible possible. Now, in the paper, I wanted to approach this history of socialism in the English-speaking Caribbean as a movement of the Caribbean proletarian consciousness and show that really this movement was driven by class antagonism and a common vision for an independent West Indian nation able to determine its own destiny on the principles of at least social and economic justice. So, Starting with the material conditions in that part of the paper, I wanted to show four things. One is the characterization of the Caribbean economy as a plantation economy. Uh, two, that the small settlements uh, grew into really widespread system of production. Uh, three, it was a form of primitive uh, capital accumulation. And four, understanding colonialism as a system of empire. And what did that mean for, for the people? extremely low wages that fell even below subsistence level. The reproduction of daily life was challenged by inadequate rights to land, uh, rents and taxes were very high. You had legal and social restrictions on acquiring land, which led to a proletarianization of the 
newly freed slaves, which in turn give rise to a high number of what Marx called the reserved army of unemployed. But, you know, during the process of proletarianization, um, the post-emancipation ex-slaves were really demanding more for their labor, which led to labor protests across the British West Indies. And I try to highlight a few of those examples because there were many. Now, the early West Indian response to capitalism saw the emergence really of two trends. You had the black nationalism of Marcus Garvey in Jamaica, and then a sort of Fabian socialism of the Trinidad Working Men's Association, TWA in Trinidad and Tobago. The TWA actually developed a relationship with the British Labour Party. So I, I tried to show a link between the left in the West Indies, of course, and the left in, in Britain at the time, in those early days. Um, in fact, the TWA General Secretary Howard Bishop had attended the Labour Party's annual conference in 1921. And um, in, by 1925, the Trinidad Working Men's Association became affiliated to the Labour and Socialist International. A major action that I try to highlight at that time too was the 1919 general strike in Trinidad and Tobago because that strike told us that workers had developed a sort of revolutionary spirit to struggle in their interest eh, to change the status quo. Uh, just in case we, we're not clear if they um, had a, a sort of vision of that transformation, the reactionary sort of uh, colonial right-wing newspapers at the time, the Trinidad Guardian actually had a, a, a an article entitled, Why the Seditious Bill is Necessary, because they wanted to pass a uh, seditious legislation to deal with the workers' uprising. And they actually claimed in that article that there was a revolutionary plot to overthrow the government. It may have been a bit of an exaggeration, but I think that it was the feeling of the elites at the time um, that that type of uprising was really a challenge to the status quo. Um, I then try to address this issue of Garveyism and socialism. You know, there is this sort of current tendency to focus on the contradiction between, between the two. Uh, but from the point of view of those who followed Garveyism at the time, that distinction really did not appear as it appears to us in, uh, you know, as contemporary persons looking back, because the idea of organizing around the question of bringing dignity to black people in a colonial context took root amongst the black masses. And it was very important, but then it became clear to many of them that it was not the solution. And so, in fact, many embraced the idea of change by ending colonialism. Um, they who embraced that idea went on to envisage the capitalist system being replaced by socialism. Um, of course, I mean, Nadine, please forgive me. I'm really trying to literally speed through this, this hundred year history, right? In 20 minutes. Now, of course, we cannot talk about Caribbean socialism without mentioning the tree giants. And I know most people here are already familiar with George Padmore, CLR James and Claudia Jones. So I will really just simply mention that Padmore's contribution was his capacity to raise the Pan-African question directly within the international socialist movement. Uh, CLR's theory of state capitalism help, can actually help us understand what the later new West Indian nation states became in that post-independence era. And Claudia kind of introduces a sort of trichotomy between class, race, and gender, and saw them as dialectic tensions, not separate, but related. And but what is really interested and interesting in her contribution is that she saw that that uh, tension can be resolved only through communism. Now, in terms of the labor unrest of the 1930s, many leaders of the 1930s revolt, such as Adrian Kola Rienzi, Clement Payne, Elmer Francois, Hugh Clifford Buchanan, uh, George McIntosh, um, Antonio Soberanes Gomez, they were socialists and played an important role in organizing the working class into trade unions. So while it is generally accepted that the labor unrest in the 1930s was a critical turning point in West Indian history, 
I think that there is less recognition of the role of socialists in leading the unrest and in organizing and establishing the labor unions that emerge out of that unrest. The 1930s unrest was revolutionary in the sense that the people that led it were very clear that democracy cannot be achieved without social and economic justice for the majority of the working people. And of course, then came the uh, Second World War. Coming out of the Second World War, British Caribbean had to contend with about five things. And, and I tried to show that in the paper. One, colonial dominance. Two, this, um, the Western imperialist powers had won the war. So there was this euphoria of victory, or arrogance of victory. Um, Keynesian capitalism, the emergence of the Bretton Woods financial architecture and the Cold War. So even um, as small communities, they had to contend with these incredibly huge issues from colonial dominance to the uh, domination of Keynesian capitalism. But during that post-war era of dominant Keynesian capitalism and continuation of con colonialism because the British empire was still at, at a high level at the time, and then you had, of course, the emergence of um, the massive industrial uh, capitalism of the US. The working class in the West Indies continued to be very active in attempting to advance the agenda of self-determination and greater social justice. And there are examples of that. So in, in that regard, I want to mention two institutions briefly, very briefly, which is the Caribbean Labor Congress and the West Indian Federation. As far back, even before the war in 1938, there was a Caribbean Labor Council that met in Guyana. And as far back as 1938, they had called for a West Indian Federation as a response to colonialism. And in fact, uh, this call for a West Indian Federation had a lot of theoretical support from key um, Marxists, such in particular CLR James, right? Now, Right at the end of the war, with the Caribbean Labor Congress being officially formed, interestingly, at its first conference, this is the first conference, Grant Lee Adams, but now remember, this is in 1945, right? Grant Lee Adams and a number of the other leaders will go on to do some, some very interesting things that uh, seem that, that really turned out to be sort of counter-revolutionary. But in 1945, they had declared that there is no hope, and this is a direct quote, um, quote, there is no hope for the West Indies unless they became a socialist commonwealth. I'll let that resonate with the audience a bit. I find that that was such an, uh, a pointed statement. But in the end, in the end, a politically united West Indies actually gave way to what was a growing insular bourgeois nationalism. And that I argued is what led to the Federation's uh, demise. Some of the um, major challenges for socialism in the West Indies, especially in that Cold War era, one of the major challenge for the newly independent West Indian nation states was their integration into the global capitalist system. You know, they have to balance now on one hand, this high expectation of the masses in terms of what comes with independence. But then on the other hand, they had to contend with and uh, becoming more entrenched into the global capitalist system. Now, much of the tensions uh, between the various forms of socialism that emerged within the um, Caribbean lay in the really inherent contradiction in which colonial societies found themselves even as they emerge as independent uh, small nation states facing, as I said, globalizing uh, capitalism, and but also new forms of imperialism that was taking shape. Um, and we haven't even reached the era of neoliberalism yet. I'll, I'll come to that a little later on. Uh, but as bourgeois ideas took root and control 
the ideological arm of these new states, whether it's the media, education, culture, etc. Uh, this really re resulted in a diverse socialisms, if you may, of the West Indies. By the 1950s, the socialist leaning organizations had, be had been systematically weakened. The pressure from Western imperialist powers and the US influence in its so-called backyard was really being felt throughout the region. Um, so that by the uh, mid to late 50s, what you had was the West Indian Independence Party in Trinidad and Tobago had collapsed. The PNP in Jamaica expelled its leading Marxist. In Guyana, the democratically elected P, uh, People Progressive Party was forced out of office. Then the PPP would later split. The Barbados Labour Party lost some 26 key leaders who went on to form the Democratic Labour Party. Now, just to go back to Guyana in, in terms of its three socialist trends. Now, on the 27th of April, 1953, Chedi Jagan became the first Marxist to be elected as a head of state in the region. But with the US and UK support, Chedi was unceremoniously removed from office. He's the democratically elected um, lead, uh, president. Huh? And then, so then Guyana then became the sort of battleground of three contending visions of socialism. Now, some argue that some of the uh, visions articulated may not be necessarily socialisms, but I'm, I wanted to take it from, from their perspective, how, how they were seeing it. So you had Cherry Jagan and the PPP who create what he called a genuine socialist society. Uh, the basic program of the PPP was anti-imperialist, uh, pro-democratic and pro-socialist. Now, remember, I'm speaking about the 50s. I'm not talking about current. Then you had Burnham and the PNC who declared Guyana to be a cooperative republic and attempted to create an economic and political system that he called cooperative socialism. And, um, and then you had a third more radical strand that emerged uh, with Walter Rodney and the Working People's Alliance. I do think that there is need for more studies of these trends, uh, how they intersect, what were their underlying differences at a fundamental level, particularly the root cause of the split of the PPP, because following that split, the politics of race between the two main ethnic groups of Indo and afro ghanis came to dominate the political landscape of Guyana. And uh, Walter really tried to break that politics of race by um, by trying to place a, even a little more emphasis on the politics of class, right? But the race politics, no pun intended, trumped the class question. And of course, the brutal murder of Walter Rodney on the 13th of June, 1980, and its implications, not only for Guyana, but for the entire region, I think needs uh, a lot more uh, looking into. An analysis, but from a socialist perspective. Um, because one of the things we always have to be careful of is that we have bourgeois historians writing the history of the left. I think that that is something we have to guard carefully against, which is why I really welcome this particular special issue of the journal. The other country to be impacted by reactionary politics of race was Trinidad and Tobago. Um, having, Trinidad and Tobago having achieved universal adult suffrage as a result of the labor unrest in 37 held its first elections on that basis in 1946. And almost all the parties involved were of left and labor leaning. So leading up to the 1937 labor rebellion, we had like Adrian Rienzi um, and the Trinidad Citizens League and the Marxist Negro Welfare and Cultural Association led by the powerful uh, Elma Francois. In 1952, an alliance was formed between the Trade Union Congress representatives and the Marxist Group Workers Freedom Movement, which resulted in the establishment of the small, openly Marxist West Indian Independence Party. One of the leaders many of you are familiar with, and that, um, of course, is John LaRose. Now, the demise of the West Indian Independence Party provided a space, really, for the rise of the politics of race in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, just to note that the intervention of the US and the UK in both Guyana and in Trinidad and Tobago in the 50s, I wanna suggest led to the rise of the politics of race. Um, one of the most important organizations in Trinidad and Tobago's socialism from the post-war era, even to present day has been the Oilfield Workers Trade Union because that, that this union has 
always taken a socialist line from its earliest days, whether it's under the president generals of Kola Rienzi, John Rojas, George Weeks. It played a key role, for example, in the establishment of the Workers and Farmers Party in 1965, led by none other than CLR James. It subsequently, along with other progressive unions, in particular the Sugar Union, forged an alliance with several other left-wing groups, uh, such as the United National Independence Party, New Beginning Movement, uh, um, and so on, to form the United Labour Front. The United Labour Front would subsequently split with the more radical left leaving to form Movement for Social Transformation in 1989, led by David Abdullah and again supported by the OWTU. But one, one particular group that I have to mention that is often not recognized or overlooked um, as part of West Indian history is the fact that there was a group that was engaged in armed struggle in Trinidad and Tobago. That is the National Union of Freedom Fighters. They were a Marxist group. They were active from 1972 to 1974. Um, and they themselves emerged in the aftermath of the Trinidad and Tobago's Black Power Revolution in 1970. And I do look forward to, to Ben's talk on Black Power and Socialism. The first Marxist in Jamaica now, looking at Jamaica's democratic socialism, considered Alan Coombs and Hugh Clifford Buchanan. They formed the Jamaica's Workers and Trades Union in 1936. Um, following the Labour Rebellion, and then Norman Manley went on to form the People's National Party, PNP, in the tradition of sort of British Fabian socialism. Although uh, Marxists like Frank Hill and we heard Richard Hart had all had joined that party, but of course we heard, as I mentioned, were expelled in, by 1954. Manley and the PNP would later compromise with capital in the belief that capital could be co-opted to realise the PNP socialist aims in government. They would go on to rule from 55 to 72. And by 1972, the PNP declared democratic socialism as their path, adopting a sort of gradualist strategy of social change, but without fundamentally changing the economic uh, powers, um, power structures. Now, I did mention in terms of the smaller islands like Antigua, St. Lucia. So I talked about the contribution of Tim Hector, who founded the Antigua Caribbean Labor Movement. Um, and then we had George Odlum from St. Lucia. Uh, there are another significant group in St. Lucia was the Workers' Revolutionary Movement that was founded in 1976. Now, on the 13th of March, 1979, the New Jewel Movement overthrew the government of Grenada in a revolution, making Gre Grenada the only socialist state within the Commonwealth. And it's considered one of the most significant events in the history of English speaking socialism. Um, but I just want to say that Really, um, whilst the both sides had agreed, there was some tensions because it, the mutual movement itself was an amalgam of several organizations, right? Which had a tension between a sort of Jamesian model of mass party with a with democratic structures embedded in communities and a more Marxist Leninist vanguard party line. And I think that tension just could not have could not it was not could not be resolved. And I had argued that the different socialists and Marxists throughout the region, they took positions on one side or the other, which really led to a quick collapse of the revolution and also made it impossible to find a united socialist response to defend the revolution, which came to a brutal and bloody end with the murder of Prime Minister Maurice Bishop and members of his cabinet. So I'm coming to conclude because I'm still trying to keep within my 20 minutes, right? The study of the socialist movement among Caribbean people is vital. And the history of class relations and class struggle is the, uh, the crucial question. The internal class dynamic and the formation of organized labor itself produced in strong resistance to any transition to socialism within the various territories and even within parties and organizations that declare themselves socialists. Um, the fact is that socialism in the English speaking Caribbean has been in retreat since the fall of the Grenadian Revolution but more importantly, with the rise of neoliberal economic hegemony. And there's been a, quite a bit of critique of it, um, of, of socialism, but I said that if you read, most of those critiques are pre-2008. So what is required is a post-2008 analysis because uh, the crisis of capital is really, I think will try, will, will should, provide a, a different framework of how we understand the possible emergence of a sort of renewed socialist agenda in our contemporary 
time, right? Um, so before I close, let me just play for a few minutes. Well, I have just about two more minutes, right? Two, just two short excerpts from um, two calypsos. One that I think captured a historical moment with the coming of the high point of socialism in English-speaking Caribbean uh, by Brother Valentino. So I, I will just, um, just quickly share that with everyone. <laughs> Right, so that was 1979, um, but in the post-2008 era, I will just quickly share a recent song that came out from um, a group of Rapso artists that I, I just, it's just a few seconds, just an excerpt from it. By the way, you all heard the first one, right? Yeah, okay, great. Down in the valley of decision, all man have to seek the position. Break the chains from this mental prison and prepare for the real revelation. Don't stand up on the pavement. Now it's time to make a statement. Get up, stand up, watch it, check it. Say to yourself, this land is mine. Okay, so as I close, um, in a sort of Jamesian fashion, I want to end as I started to state that the diverse socialist voices, organizations, parties, and movements all shared, and I want to suggest that we still share this common vision for a truly independent West Indian society able to determine its own destiny on the principles of social and economic justice. Thank you. Thanks very much, Josie. That was really interesting. Um, and we're going to take questions later on, but I'm going to move on to Ben. Um, and as you said, Josie, he's going to talk about Black power and socialism in English-speaking uh, Caribbean. And Ben is working as a research associate at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Ben. You have 20 minutes, Steve. Yeah, fab. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so to start off with, I'd just like to echo Aussie's, uh, Aussie's sentiment and Aussie's praise for uh, Caribbean Labour Solidarity and the Socialist History Society for putting the special issue together. Um, I think it's a really important intervention. I think the, the final product is something that uh, everyone involved is, can be proud of. So um, yeah, if you, if you get the chance, please do please do read it. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen because I've actually got some slides. So hopefully this will, uh, this will work fine. Uh, so yeah, can we see that? Yeah. Okay, well, wait, let's go back to the start. It usually helps. Okay. Yeah, so um, today, Oops, <laughs> I'm going to be talking about uh, Black Panthers in the West Indies. Um, I actually have moved recently, so I'm now uh, at the University of Oxford uh, working as a lecturer. Uh, so the bio is about a date, but that's, <laughs> that's my fault. So I should have, should have dated. Um, but yeah. So to start with, then, um, 
black power, as expressed in the West Indies, first erupted into the region's popular consciousness in October 1968, uh, following what were termed the Rodney Riots in Kingston, Jamaica. These riots began as a protest march instigated by University of the West Indies students following the banning of Guyanese intellectual, key black power theorist and socialist historian Walter Rodney from the island. Violence broke out in the afternoon after marchers were subjected to police attacks and the protesters' ranks were swelled by demonstrators from Kingston's poorer neighbourhoods. I suggest that we can understand the Rodney riots and the popular emergence of black power in the West Indies in the context of the 1968 moment, if you like. Um, and this is a framing that's been utilised by the Caribbean Canadian scholar David Austin uh, in his study of black power in uh, Canada and the Congress of Black Writers in Montreal. Um, so, yeah, Austin reminds us that 1968 was an apocal year, he says, for radical and left politics globally. With the well-known events of that year, so the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the French General Strike, Prague Spring, etc., seem to have constituted something of a high watermark. The 1960s saw a proliferation of anti-colonial, anti-biased, anti-racist struggles globally, from the solidification of the Cuban Revolution to the liberation wars against Portuguese imperialism in Africa and the civil rights and black power movements in the United States. These events had significant impact on the articulation of socialist politics through black power in the West Indies. Many involved in the movement had visited Cuba and or had contact with radical African-American figures in the United States. Similarly, a consistent focus on African liberation wars and the Marxist-Leninist groups, who were oftentimes waging them, presaged a move towards that form of organization in later years. Of course, the events and political movements of 1968, whilst novel, did not emerge sui generis, right? They're not something so, totally new. Uh, and the political tendencies that emerged into popular consciousness at this time in the West Indies represented reformulations and rearticulations of longstanding historical currents. Um, and in the Caribbean context, the long history of socialist politics in the region prior to the late 1960s has been well attested to by Aussie, as, as we've just heard. And so this is sort of the, the setting for uh, how black power emerges. So the political projects of anti-capitalism, anti-racism and anti-imperialism were nothing new in the Caribbean in 1968. However, their specific formulation and articulation through a politics of black power did represent something unique. And it's with this framing that I've sought to understand how black power in the West Indies um, emerged and, and, and was articulated, as I've said. And today I hope to briefly sketch out how this developed uh, and, and sort of go through some specific examples that I discuss in the in the paper as well. Uh, so to start off with then, um, I was perhaps on well, power articulation of socialism was sort of um, directed towards doing most often was analysing neocolonialism in the West Indies and, and trying to dismantle it. And so with independence for Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago in 1962, um, the political or the age of political independence began in the region. And, and by the time the Black Power movement in the West Indies really gets going in the late 1960s, Guyana and Barbados had also gained independence as well. And so what this meant was that Black Power actors and groups were now operating in a different context to West Indian socialists that preceded them. This was a context in which independent nation states had now been established in the region and had to be confronted as they actually existed and not contested in principle or theory. And similarly, the political economy of capitalist imperialism and now neocolonialism had also shifted and changed in this new context, and black power actors provided insightful analyses of these new developments. Black power groups would articulate a sharp socialist and anti-capitalist analysis of the newly independent states in the region. Uh, and of particular interest here was the reworking of West Indian political economy in an age of political independence. In my article, I discussed the Jamaican publication Abeng, which is a, a sort of black power journal published in 1969. Uh, and it routinely attacked the continued exploitation of black labor on the island by white capital and the exploitation, uh, sorry, the extraction of profit from the region uh, to the imperial metropoles. The sugar industry was of particular interest here due to the long history of profit extraction, racial terror and exploitation that characterized the plantation system that powerfully shaped the West Indies for centuries. However, new industries were also considered. Uh, so the mining of bauxite, which began in significant ways in the 1950s, uh, primarily in Jamaica, was understood as representing a more modern reformulation of these long-standing relations of capitalist and racial exploitation uh, consolidated in the earlier form uh, in the shape of the sugar plantation. 
The primary profiteers of this new industry were Canadian and American firms. And again, this was understood by black power actors to be representative of the shifting balance of power within the imperialist world system uh, after the end of the Second World War, uh, and sort of which had been consolidated by the 60s. And so the United States was now the global capitalist hegemon, and the economies of the West Indies would be reoriented around this new pole uh, and away from Britain as the former colonial power. Further, in Abeng, this, uh, this Black Power Journal I'm discussing, uh, political economic assessment of Jamaica and the wider region, there's a sharp focus on the role of the Jamaican government as an independent government uh, and petty bourgeoisie in the reproduction of relations of dependency after independence. Uh, as they termed it, the Jamaican slave government uh, and its class allies that cooperated with foreign capital in perpetrating injustices against the people uh, were the subject of a sharp neo-colonial analysis. These assessments of West Indian neo-colonialism are developed in the work of the Black Power movement and the West Indies key think thinkers. Um, and so paramount and foremost here uh, would be Walter Rodney. Um, and so in his highly influential text, The Groundings of My Brothers, um, he developed a sharp critique of the post-independent settlements uh, of the West Indies that were emerging during this time. And so for Rodney, an analysis of neo-colonialism was central in his formulation and assessment of Black Power politics in the region. Rodney deployed a core periphery model of a world shaped by imperialism where, quote, every country in the dominant metropolitan areas has a large majority of whites, so the USA, Britain, France, etc., whereas every country in the dominated colonial areas has an overwhelming majority of non-whites, as in most of Asia, Africa, and the West Indies, unquote. And whilst this analysis could be applied to the colonial period, Rodney develops his thinking for the period of decolonization. Uh, he countered the notion that independence in and of itself meant power for the colonial world, so formerly colonized world. Um, and Rodney stated that black men ruling dependent states were, quote, simply agents of the whites in the metropolis with an army and a police force designed to maintain the imperialist way of doing things in that particular colonial area. Building on this, uh, in, in future articles that I discussed in the paper, um, Rodney sort of develops a Fanonian, uh, uh, or develops Franz Fanon's conception of neo-colonial politics as a process of retrogression, um, which he applies to the post-colonial Caribbean. The most significant factor that Rodney saw in shaping the situation uh, was the consolidation of the petty bourgeoisie as a class around the state in his terms. Rodney saw that in the West Indies, independence had led to the strategic control of the state by an emergent black middle class that was bureaucratic, careerist, and that leverages state control to consolidate their position as members of the petty bourgeoisie. Control of the state and political institutions secured the class reproduction of this sector of the petty bourgeois. Um, and fellow Guyanese intellectual and, and black power advocate Clive Thomas uh, describes this process in greater detail uh, in his Marxist uh, analysis uh, and text the rise of the authoritarian state in peripheral societies, which was first published in 1984. Um, and like Rodney, Thomas considered that in the periphery, the capture of political power by this element of the petty bourgeoisie uh, was the basis for consolidating their economic power. Um, and so state power is expanded not to combat the influence of metropolitan capital, despite common claims by nationalist leaders, but to instead consolidate the political class's control over local capital and local capital accumulation regimes. The capture of state power then was often used as the basis for strengthening ties with metropolitan capital and imperial states to prop up these neo-colonial economies and to call upon assistance when their class rule was challenged. Uh, so moving on to uh, a racial basis or a racial articulation of this uh, anti-capitalist and socialist analysis developed by black power thinkers. Um, a core element of this neo-colonial socialist analysis uh, was the recognition of the continued salience of colonial categories of race in the region, even after independence. Um, and so just as the more economic analysis discussed previously centered on the West Indian petty bourgeoisie or middle class, there was a similar trend in this more radical um, sort of social and cultural analysis. And the major focus here was in elite constructions of nationhood and citizenship uh, in these new states in the Caribbean, uh, in the West Indies. Um, and so C.L.R. James, uh, who's sort of drawn on widely by these various black power groups um, and thinkers, 
noted in his analysis of this uh, sector uh, of West Indian society that the political culture of middle class nationalists was one of deference and imitation of the British colonial sorry state to advance through the bureaucratic ranks. Um, and so this meant in his assessment that West Indian nationalist parties and their middle class leadership were viewed as the legitimate and safe option during the decolonization process, uh, in part because of their uptake and mastery of British culture, political forms and statecraft. Um, you know, and that contrasts this to some of the more radical uh, socialist alternatives that were being articulated in the 40s, 50s um, that Aussie discussed previously as well. Uh, but ultimately, for James, this meant that, quote, the social and psychological imprint of colonialism on the nationalist heir apparent was reinforced by the imperatives for legitimate su succession to the colonial estate. Um, and so in sum, this meant that nationality and citizenship remained embedded within colonial racial stereotypes and logics in the ideology of West Indian nationalist leaders and parties uh, of the sort of liberal mainstream character. Race as the central axis of social stratification within the British West Indies, um, you know, through the colonial period and, and under slavery and post-emancipation up to independence. Um, and during constitutional decolonization, um, the racial hierarchy instituted by the plantocracy and, and on the plantation wasn't dismantled. <clears throat> it was retained, albeit modified, uh, with the white colonizers now gone. And that was the sort of black power perspective on it <laughs> in some. The post-colonial nation state was headed by a political class which had gained its position by mastering and mirroring the political practices and culture of the imperial metropole. Um, and then its nationalist politics would seek to build modern nation states and national citizenries through the imitation of the liberal capitalist nationalisms of the imperial core, and in particular the British state and parliamentary system. And so analysis of this race politics of mainstream, quote unquote, West Indian post-colonial nationalism can again be found in Abing, which is the Black Power Journal I was discussing earlier. Um, and this analysis here is articulated with multiple antagonisms to highlight the dual class and race oppression um, of non-white West Indians, but in this context, particularly black Jamaicans. Um, and so in the first issue published in February 1969, uh, I've got a quote here on screen from that. There's a denunciation of the imposition of minimum five-year sentences with flogging for acts of robbery um, and this was a law that was targeting specifically Kingston's poor urban black youth. And this is where the quote comes from. Right. And so here, Abeng specifically, but this is sort of uh, symptomatic of, of broader black power um, analysis and politics. The crimes of the political and middle class, which would be corruption, the selling out of national resources and labor to foreign capital, uh, are contrasted against the petty crimes of the, the poor uh, racialized mass population. And so the neo-colonial state structure and the political economy upon which it rests was understood to be maintained and experienced through colonial logics of race and racism, even after independence. Um, and the continued colonial nature of the Jamaican state and criminal justice system are here being highlighted um, as Abeng, you know, discusses the, the handing down of sentences of flogging from independent West Indian governments um, and West Indian men uh, as an act of social discipline rooted in the same racist logics. Uh, and stereotypes of the slave plantation. Um, so moving on to kind of the second major thing I want to talk about today and I discussed in the paper, and that would be the importance of transnational solidarity and, and third worldism within uh, black power and black power articulations of socialism. Um, and so the analysis of a world system of imperialism and it's working through structures of race and racism that we've discussed so far that was developed by black power actors necessarily spurred the formation uh, of a transnational politics of solidarity with other socialist, anti-racist and anti-colonial forces globally contesting these same um, oppressive structures. And so um, there's sort of two areas or two specific regions that I'll pick out here um, that are important to, to this movement, but Africa and the anti-imperialist and national liberation wars waged in the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s on the continent were a constant point of reference for West Indian black power groups. Um, and many of these struggles being waged in Africa, these anti-colonial struggles, were being led by socialist or communist guerrillas and, and parties. Uh, and so black power groups were particularly interested in this. They reported on it all the time um, and extended uh, solidarity to these, to these struggles. Um, and so the, the picture I have there, again, comes from Abeng, but it's a 
comes from a regular column that was entitled African Battle Line. Um, and it covered the many battles being fought in Africa. Um, that was its aim against foreign imperialist aggression and domination in the late 1960s. And with many of these struggles, as I said, led by socialist anti-colonial revolutionaries. Um, just as a, a way of an example, in a March 1969 uh, article from Abeng, uh, the, the paper surveys the anti-colonial wars being waged across Southern Africa. Um, and it highlighted in particular the struggle for liberation against Portuguese imperialism in Angola and Mozambique with these efforts led by the communist aligned MPLA and Falimo. Um, and in the same article, it's noted that there's an international reactionary alliance that opposed these freedom struggles. Um, so Ian Smith's Rhodesia, apartheid South Africa and fascist Portugal were seen to be cooperating in the repression of black and socialist revolution across Southern Africa, aided by some neo-colonial leaders of nominally independent African states. Um, and this reactionary coalition were said to construct themselves as, quote, the defenders of Christianity and civilization against black power and communism, unquote. Uh, and so in these anti-colonial struggles in Africa, the dual goals of black power and communism were seen to be tied by black power actors in the West Indies, with African socialists at the forefront of efforts to win these goals. This attaching of the black power label to anti-colonial movements in Africa was sort of a projection on the part of West Indian black power actors, but notably this fusion of Caribbean pan-Africanists and black nationalist traditions with communist traditions or socialist traditions represented an authentic innovation on the part of West Indian black power. Okay, so sort of the final point to close out on would be um, Cuba, right? Um, so for black power actors in the West Indies who were interested in articulating socialist politics, there was a third world, this communist revolution far closer to in Africa, and that was Cuba. And so this is a consistent point of reference in black power work and, and, and activism. And so the Cuban revolution and its personification and figures such as Castro and, and Guevara were often understood as symbols of the global revolutionary upsurge that had occurred throughout the 1960s and sort of culminated in 1968, as I was discussing earlier. Um, and so I've got some quotes from an oil field workers um, paper here. It's official, it's official publication, The Vanguard. Um, and this is from an article from 1969, assessing these various revolutionary currents. Um, and, and this piece sort of positions black youth across the world as a catalyst for revolutionary change. And so the article noted that a protest march led by University of the West Indies students in Port of Spain had been organized in response to the Smith regime of Rhodesia executing black independence fighters. And so to quote the article, um, quote, in so doing, the students were defending the armed revolution of their black brothers through their protests. And this article goes on to say that a global system of white capitalist imperialism is maintained by systematic violence and thus violent struggle against it can be justified. In closing, the article draws strength from the examples of figures who opposed the oppressive world system. And this is the quote I have on screen here. Um, and so in this piece, we see the interconnection of a number of threads picked out in this paper and in this presentation. Um, so firstly, there's an analysis of world imperialism that is understood to oppress uh, subaltern groups along the mutually constitutive categories of race and class. This system was understood to be upheld by all manner of violent injustices uh, that necessitates revolutionary opposition to overcome it. Um, and finally, and interestingly, that blackness, uh, as identified by the quote, um, in many senses denoted a political subjectivity more than sort of phenotype in, in, in this instance. Um, and it could incorporate all manner of groups and identities through common experience of racial and class oppression or commitment to anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, and anti-racist struggles. Uh, so just to, to close out here, um, by the mid-70s, uh, the popular enthusiasm for black power had waned in the region and sort of globally, to be honest. Uh, and many figures and groups associated with the movement uh, in the region had either sort of disappeared or transitioned into more explicitly left political parties and movements. Uh, so many of them moved into Marxist-Leninist parties, um, perhaps jettisoning the race consciousness and mass-based politics of black power for the democratic centralism and vanguard vanguardism sorry, of the Len Leninist revolutionary organization. Um, this movement <clears throat> is not entirely surprising if we consider the various currents that move through West Indian black power. 
Um, and so the more black or cultural nationalist adherents of Rastafari or Pan-Africanism often sat uneasily with those who saw in black power the legacies of Caribbean socialism and a more class-based commitment to anti-imperialism um, than sort of forms of racial solidarity articulated by the former groups. But what West Indian black power was successful in doing was animating popular consciousness around notions of revolutionary change in the West Indies in the post-colonial period, uh, immediately after independence, uh, and particularly in sharpening critiques of neocolonialism in the region, again, you know, as, this, as we're moving into the era of, of self-government. The movement reached its limits in actually affecting significant revolutionary change or taking the post-colonial state head on. In such confrontations, the lack of a clear and consistent ideological position and organizational form represented a strategic weakness. Um, but by the time the shift to Marxist party organization occurred in the region, the question was not whether revolutionary change was required after independence, but how best to achieve this. Um, in the transition away from black power, um, there was often something lost uh, that the West Indian theorist and scholar Brian Meeks has described as, quote, an openness and diversity of political forms and politics and critically an appreciation of the importance of counter symbolic and counter hegemonic popular forms, unquote. And that latter point is, I think, a crucial contribution of West Indian black power to socialist politics. Black power was successful. Uh, in that it was able to articulate a socialist politics and, and, an, and analysis, sorry, in a local idiom and popular forms. Uh, and that's why I frequently turn to the work of Walter Rodney uh, in the article, and, and I've discussed him here today, because Rodney was able to combine Marxist political economic analysis of the post-colonial Caribbean with an appreciation of popular narrative to inaugurate a mass-based politics that could challenge both racial and class oppression in the West Indies in terms intelligible to the peoples of the region. Um, so that's me finished. Uh, I'm happy to, to take questions and discuss things more. So okay, thanks. Sharing. Thanks very much, Ben. That was really interesting. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions to both you and to Ozzy. Um, so please indicate either with your hand or um, digitally whether you've got a question to ask or a comment to make. Is there anybody wants to raise a question to Ozzy or Luke, have you got your hand up? You need to unmute. Thank you. Um, thanks to the speakers. I think it was a really fantastic um, meeting so far, full of so many questions, more questions than answers, I think, that we can deliver today. Um, I miss the most of um, Francisco's talk because um, poor connection at the beginning. I don't know if Francisco is still with us, but um, I would anticipate he would have delivered um, the, up to date on what is happening in Latin America, which for me is the most hopeful region in the world today in terms of revolutionary change and socialism being established. But the question I wanted to ask Francisco is what is happening with the um, Black Lives Movement in the region and also about um, the movement for reparations for slavery and native genocide as it's um, coined now in the Caribbean. Um, and for Ozzy, I, I had a question for you. Thanks for your presentation today. And I, I noticed you talked about the emergence of race politics, um, but you didn't, and I know you didn't have much time, but actually to go into how that emergence um, came about. Um, and this is really referring to, especially in Guyana and Trinidad, with the mostly, you know, Afro and Indo populations um, and the involvement of CIA and um, British intelligence in stirring up racial hatred um, during that period, because it's not something that emerged naturally. I think it was assisted in, in many ways. And for, uh, for Ben, I think I'm also speaking on the, the, the whole Black Power movement and how that um, developed in the in, in in the region i thought there was some opposition even from within the the the, the, the caribbean and certainly for me and guyana growing up um 
it was kind of like, you know, we've already got black power, you know, so this movement then seemed to be relevant for us. And of course, you know, as you rightly pointed out, these neo-colonial um, structures that were put in place after colonialism wasn't really about empowering the masses. And so I think, um, yes, I think that's really significant. And in terms of Walter Rodney's contribution throughout the, the entire region in, in his politics, and of course, you know, being banned from Jamaica because he was taking up um, that trying to take the message to the to the masses in the dongle and so on. And how does that, um, in, in some ways, we see the way in which the neoliberals are still in control of the the political space um, unashamedly, um, as I sit here in Jamaica, awarding themselves a 200% increase as politicians. Um, and sadly, not enough mass protests in the streets, in my opinion. It's just such an outrageous um, position for, for them to take. And with the opposition party also not reacting strongly enough against it, says that um, there's still a lot of work to be done in fostering socialist ideals in the region. OK, I'll end there. Thanks. So Francisco. Nadine, is all right? Come in. So it's an interesting question. Please reply. All right. Yes. Um, we, we know that um, some Black politicians have come to the fore in the region, especially in Brazil and Colombia recently. And the Black Lives Movement has kind of um, at least started some protests and some footing. But I wondered if the, what is happening with, around the reparations for slavery and native genocide movement, and is that gaining any traction in any of the countries in Latin America? Yeah, can I come, can I come in? Yes, please do, Francesco. Um, because of the setbacks that the region suffered as a result of the you know, imperialist offensive, counter-offensive between 2009 and 2019, where the US and their accomplices, particularly with the support of Europe, were able to overthrow a few governments and then defeat politically and electorally a few other more. And the line of progress was actually being held mainly by Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. You know, Lula was more or less in prison. So all the movements in that region suffered a setback. The surprising things, not the surprising, but the very good surprising things is that the, um, the vice president of Colombia is a black woman. She's very, very politically conscious of the question of, you know, the right of black people and the question of racism. Um, in, in Brazil, there is a strong, uh, very, very strong uh, black consciousness movement. And there is an organization of Afro descendants and so forth. But the country that is in the lead in terms of organizing against racism, to organize black people, to organize Afro-descendants, as they call them, is basically Venezuela at the moment. They have held about four international delegations. They set up their own organization in, in Venezuela itself. Um, the culture of the country is such that leaders of indigenous uh, stock in the past, as well as slaves who led rebellions, or leader of slaves that led, led rebellions, actually have been glorified, you know, really positively. Uh, they are in the notes of the country, in the bank notes. They are in the coins, there are statues of them everywhere, the squares, piazzas, institutions, avenues, and so on, have their names. So there is, and this is included in the curriculum. Um, but in terms of the main, as I understand it from the point of view of overall uh, approach on this question, the question of Haiti is the one that concerns them the most. Um, in terms of the movement for reparations, I, I think it hasn't got any traction yet. And if there is, it's very weak. 
So, and the reason is they are dealing with the legacy led by the neoliberals, which nearly wrecked their economies in about two, three, four years. Uh, in the case of Brazil, in the case of Bolivia, in, in certainly in the case of Colombia, where there is a, a strong potential for that is certainly in Colombia, certainly in Brazil, certainly in Venezuela, and Cuba, you know, is always there. But there is no movement as such that is actually articulating at the regional level the question of reparations. There is the question of anti-racism and the struggle against racism in the context of the consequences of neoliberalism. Um, I think the potential is great, but we have to allow for them to deal with the most important thing at the moment, which is poverty, um, you know, and the legacy of neoliberalism. Just to it, final finalize the point, uh, Lula, when he won the election, just before the final week leading to the election, he said that the key priority was there were 33 million people in Brazil that could not did not eat three times a day. And there were 100 million people actually that were living below the poverty of life. That was the legacy of Bolsonaro in four years. And he said, that is absolutely my priority. And unless you're actually able to address those things, people who have a specific demand, such as the black population, would not be able to organize because they have to concentrate on day-to-day -day things. So I think it's going to, there is the potential there, but not yet. Can I ask a question? on the presentations by Ossian. Please do, by, please do. By, just go, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it came to, I mean, I'm, my knowledge of the Caribbean and of the West Indies is not as great of, as that of the rest of Latin America. But in terms of politics, one of the things that actually has allowed, as in the rest of the continent, Mexico, Venezuela, and Cuba, and so on, is this. It is this. The working class, because of the legacy of imperialism, colonialism, and, and development, and now neoliberalism, the size of the working class, the size of the proletariat is very small, inevitably, with a few exceptions, perhaps Brazil, perhaps Argentina, but you know, all the rest of the countries, the working class is quite small. In many places, you have a large peasantry, um, even though that has been decimated as a consequence of the immigration to the cities. So what you have in the cities is a huge, I don't know what to call them, declasse, but you know, people who live in the informal sector, which is huge. In Bolivia, for example, the, the proletariat is very small. The peasantry is very big, but it's not in the countryside anymore. The Bolivian peasantry is in the cities and 65% of the economy is of the working of the people who work actually are part of the informal sector. So this raises the following question. Those people who actually survive in the informal sector are technically and sociologically petty bourgeois, as far as I'm concerned. So the proletariat has to lead the petty bourgeoisie. So what makes a particular political approach petty bourgeois? And how panel alliances of the kind needed, such as the proletariat, the petty bourgeoisie, and the peasantry, or equivalent, be able to form together to fight for this aspiration, which is the socialist solution to the problem of that the Caribbean has been facing, you know, for centuries. I'll leave that. Thank you. Thanks, Francisco. Now, Ozzy, could I ask you to tackle these two rather large questions you've been asked by? both Luke and Francesco? Yeah, <laughs> thanks Luke and Francesco for those very big questions. Um, so I'm gonna try to my best in, the, in a short space of time. In terms of Luke, I mean, that question of the politics of race is a very big question, especially Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. Now I, I sort of browse, I, I hinted to it, but I was on fast speed. So it, it went whoosh. So I, I'm glad you gave me an opportunity to go back to it a little bit. And I'm going to throw in Jamaica. I know it's going to sound strange, but I'm going to throw Jamaica in. And you'll hear why at the end. Now, in terms of Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, I had mentioned we cannot overstate the intervention of the U.S. and the U.K. in that period cannot overstate it. In fact, that those interventions were critical to lay a sort of 
what they would be considered a more moderate landscape to manage the independence. What, what do I mean? So let me start with Trinidad and Tobago. When we had our first elections in 46, and then again, we had the next one in 50, the majority of the politics, the parties, and the persons who went up and won seats in the Legislative Council were socialists or labor leading, right? And coming, especially coming out of the 1950 elections, you had the formation. Now, when, when I say there were socialists, it, it means it had Indo and Afro uh, Trinbagonians in the same camp. So even Butler, Butler's party at the time, you had both Indo and Afro together, right? Who won seats. Same thing happened in 1950. Um, and then in 52, with the emergence of the West Indian Independence Party, um, you really had uh, an amalgamation of, you had people like Olai Muhammad, who was part of the leadership of, of, of the West Indian Independence Party. You had um, people like Lennox Pierre, you had um, Quentin O'Connor, John Rojas. So the, the race question wasn't there. The class question was. And so what happened is the US and the UK State, Dep um, State Department intervened and told the leadership of the West Indian Independence Party because they were also leaders of trade unions by threatening the pay, the checkoff system. Basically told them you have to choose either the you're a leader of trade unions, so either you do your trade union work, but you see this party, politic, class, politic work, forget it. With that in the, uh, intervention, very specific concrete intervention, it led to the demise of the West Indian Independence Party. Now, because of that, that is now remember the date, that is 1952. As a result of that, it created a space for the emergence of a sort of bourgeois, nationalism and then you see the emergence of the people's national movement and then you had the democratic labor front so you see the division into political camps on the basis of race not class as a result of that intervention in 1953 as that was trinidad and tobago and of course that entrenched um politics of race really uh, concretized or crystallized by, the, by 1960. In terms of Guyana, you had uh, the, P the PPP in 1953 had everybody, it had both Afro and Indo-Guyanese um, involved. But then you had the intervention in 1953 uh, where they removed um, Chetty Jagan. And I'm suggesting that that intervention provided a space because Burnham, who was, he was originally, a lot of people forget that, but Burnham was originally part of the PPP. He left in 1955, right? And he felt that, listen, for him to get mass support, he wanted to um, attract the Afro-Guyanese bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie, as Francisco was uh, mentioning. And so I'm suggesting that it is the direct intervention of these imperialist powers that broke up the sort of what was emerging as strong class-based parties with socialist agenda um, agendas. They deliberately broke those uh, broke those things and therefore provided a platform and a space for the emergence of the politics of race. Now you ask, okay, how does Jamaica fit in that? I want to suggest. That they did a similar thing, but they didn't. But they didn't have the race card to play. So what they did is by the forcing the and into what I'm suggesting, the intervention that led to the expulsion, uh, in particular of the four H's in 1954. What that did is led to the politics of the gun, G politics of gangsterism, because they didn't have the race politics. So what am I suggesting? That the intervention of the US, of the imperialist powers in 1952 in Trinidad and Tobago led to uh, the space for the emergence of the politics of race. Intervention in 1953 in Guyana did the same thing. And the intervention in 1954 in Jamaica did not emerge the politics of race, but the politics of, the, of, of gangs. 
So that was the first question. On to Francisco uh, question. I think one of the things we have to contend with, um, especially in it is in the West Indies, is the process of bourgeoisification. That is a serious process. By the bourgeoisie and the elites taking complete control of the ideological arm of the state, it engaged in a systematic process of deep proletarianizing the workforce. I don't know, I, I kind of create a new term there, right? Which is to suggest that in order for one to have uh, better material conditions in terms of your reproduction of your daily life, then you have to fall in line with the neoliberal order, okay? And I think this has created um, um, a lot of difficulty in trying to even forge alliances because in terms of, uh, for sure, in Trinidad and Tobago and in Guyana, the petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie, it both Indo and Afro, they want to maintain their control over these structures of power. Um, and therefore what will be required is a strengthening of the class consciousness of the workers, both in the agricultural service and industrial sectors, because I do agree with you, that the this new um, new informal sector of workers, which is huge, it's 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 incredible. That they they, they formerly you know some people call it the precariat, right? I think that is where we have to begin to organize and mobilize. More, I, I really think that is where our strength for a socialist agenda will come from. Alliances with the petty bourgeoisie, I see that as not tactically, as a political tactic. Um, I would not, I would, I would venture to say that that will prove to be um, to the detriment in the long term of a socialist agenda versus organizing and mobilizing the workers in the informal sector or the precariat. And so that they themselves see themselves as part of a proletarian consciousness. Two difficult questions that I tried my best to, <laughs> to give. Um, each one of those questions is of a whole session by itself, by the way, right? So I tried. Yeah. Can I come back very quickly with a comment and, and leave it, if that's okay, because it's a fascinating conversation. Nadine, can I? Hi, it's good, Francesca. It's really interesting yeah. conversation. My, I mean, I, in my question, I couldn't clarify this, but my, my understanding of the alliance is this. Unless the proletariat, that is to say the socialist consciousness part of it, has hegemony over the alliance, then it will happen what you're just suggesting. And there are a few examples, but I mentioned only two, which are very quickly. In China, in 1949, there was almost no proletariat, and 85%, 90% of the population was actually peasant, that is to say, petty bourgeois. Nevertheless, the 1949 revolution was a communist revolution led by that part, the socialist conscious part of the country. And you know, you have seen what they've been able to do. In the case of Bolivia, the proletariat, because of neoliberalism, literally disappeared. There was no proletariat anymore. And then what you have is a, a rising of the indigenous masses, displaced indigenous masses that were living in the urban sector as part of the informal sector, 60, 65% of it. And the mass, the MAS, the Conscious Socialist Party, led by an indigenous person, Evo Morales, was actually able to galvanize, exert hegemony, and brought about you know, what is clearly a social revolution without a proletariat, put it that way. So that's the sense of my question, but I leave it there as part of the conversation. Thank you very much, Jose, for your answer. Thank you, Francesco. Um, ben, do you want to come back on the questions? Um, yeah, well, I'll, um, I suppose just to, uh, I've been going in the chat and what Luke said, you know, the sort of Jamaican politicians or political class giving themselves a 200% uh, pay rise or whatever. Um, that sort of speaks to what a lot of the kind of class or 
um, you know, analysis of the newly independent state that black power actors are engaging in, right? You know, they saw the political class um, or sort of middle class political figures as using their position within the state to essentially secure their basis for the continued reproduction of their class or for their um uh for their for their class position and so you know the sort of kind of fits with that right <laughs> you get into power and then you just you know use state largesse or whatever to, to to give yourself pay rises so it's interesting that that critique perhaps still resonates today in 2023 and that you know this is being made in the the mid 60s um which is you know slightly depressing um on to francisco uh his <laughs> as ozzy said enormous question um i've just got a couple of Kind of thoughts here um i suppose first well the first thing to say is that black power groups in the west indies were very interested in you know this well this group what you might call it precariat uh petty bourgeois you know sort of urban informal workers sector whatever you might like um and you know that took up particularly in the jamaican black power movement that took up a lot of their sort of time in terms of I guess organizing, but also like reporting in their papers that you know they're constantly interested in the sort of daily struggles of these people, um, and tried to sort of develop a kind of socialist class and race line. And I guess you know on this question of how to form a kind of <laughs> uh, progressive alliance or how to win, you know, sort of proletarian hegemony over this group, you know, maybe black power and black well so black power articulations of socialism a kind of a response to this and in, in a way that they could use race or, or racial oppression as a sort of common antagonism or, or or a common experience to organize around um sort of across these different sort of class fractions basically i think you know to varying degrees and and, and with varying intensities amongst different trends within the black power movement this is something that was kind of attempted right and so they would appeal to you know people's essentially you know shared position within a white supremacist world system uh, and sort of use that as a sort of a basis um and again as i was saying in, in my talk you know the sort of analysis of imperialism and neocolonialism that was sort of really central to to what black bar was doing again you know i think um sort of developing what i just said there you know this focus on um how sort of the imperialist world system had shifted and how it sort of you know, uh, move to incorporate these newly independent states and, you know, sort of these new bourgeois nationalists and, and bourgeois nationalist leaders. Again, this sort of developing a sort of clear kind of anti-imperialist analysis or line um, was a means to sort of raise a collective consciousness around socialist transformation, um, you know, and again, sort of appeal to this shared position of, you know, uh, oppression within uh, an imperialist world system or being oppressed by imperialist forces, you know, despite these different class fractions or sections. Um, yeah. And so <laughs> I think as, as incoherent as those thoughts are, you know, I think black power has, you know, or was trying to grapple with these questions um, in the sixties in, in different ways, of course, the context is new, but I think, you know, there's sort of something in there, perhaps, you know, thinking about again, neocolonialism uh, an anti-imperialist line, all this sort of stuff. Thank you, Ben. Um, we've also got somebody who's been been trying to come in. Um, would you like to talk now, Palmer, and ask a question? Can't see at the moment. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go on to. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Do you want to ask Here's a question? All protocol observe. Um, no, it might not be more than where you are now, but I just okay. have a question to Hazi and Francisco. Um, due to the movement of Lula and Maduro, um, Brazil and Venezuela recent geopolitical, um, you know, victory, so to speak, what signal do you think that sent to socialist-minded persons in the Caribbean? And the second question, um, does or do Jose or Francisco see um, the see the movement of Brazil and Venezuela as a moral victory um, for socialism? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take the question from Joseph and then ask the speakers to respond to both of them. 
Joseph, do you yeah, want to ask a question? Yeah, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. And well, and I'm very impressed with the presentation, particularly the second, the last two. I didn't hear the first one. Uh, in terms of my question and a comment, um, in the past, the Caribbean have influenced different parts of the world, including Africa, in terms of the momentum of, of, of change or resistance against colonialism and imperialism. Is it possible that this time around, what is happening in Africa could help to give input us to a new, a new stage of revolution in the Caribbean? I'm speaking particularly about what is happening in South Africa where the ANC is falling apart and you have you having the rise of the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters, who just got a big a victory in the free, Orange Free State, I think, um, against the ANC. Uh, can, do we see, and then the effort for unification of Africa uh, uh, from a, a continental point of view. And since we were talking about black power and nationalism and that kind of thing, do we see that some energy flowing over to our side from what is happening there? And also the fact that Africa is beginning to stand up to imperialism. Do we see any, any kind of benefit from what is happening? In fact, I've, I've often heard many speakers from Africa reference the Caribbean whether it's Cuba, whether it's France or none, and uh, uh, the other folks who have made an outstanding contribution to the world scene. Can you comment on that for me, please? Thank you. Can I go to Ozzy first of all to reply to those two questions? And then Ben, and see if Francesco wants to say anything. Um, all right. Well, I think the two questions are sort of interrelated in the sense that I, I do see that the victory of Lula, um, as well as the continuity of Maduro. Um, but I want to throw in a mix to the victory of the Colombian president. Um, I believe Francesco mentioned mentioned her. I think that's also, uh, that is also important. And there were one or two other important victories. I think it's important because they, pro they do provide hope. Um, and I, I, I'll say why. If you recall at the early 2000s with the emergence of Chavez and then the first uh, part of Lula's um, rule and so on, there was, of course, the feeling of victory and, you know, that there is the possibility of socialism again. And this is right coming out of the neoliberal era. But then there were a couple setbacks, huge setbacks, right? Constitutional coups um, and, and of course, but I, I think people were sort of watching to see, are, are these setbacks permanent? But with the re-emergence of Lula, the victory in Colombia, Maduro continuing um, to hold on, I think now you begin to feel a greater sense of hope. I'm saying that there's a difference. Meaning the, uh, after the first rounds, you're kind of watching to see because it's now emerging. And then you see the setbacks and you're thinking, okay, maybe it was just a, a sort of, flash in the pan, but then you see the struggle and the progressive movement really persevering and holding on. I mean, even in Bolivia with Eva Morales, you saw some setbacks there, but then you see again, so you, now that there is this sense that there it may be a possible permanency of progressive politics and socialist agenda, I think that offers hope for the, the, the rest of us, definitely. Now, in terms of the second question with Andrew, and there, is all, there has always really been this sort of global connection. And I believe Ben was capturing that quite nicely in his presentation, where you sort of, you know, the different, uh, let me see how to put, it's, it, instead of seeing it as insular movements for freedom, we really see it as sort of a general type of collective spirit. I kind of mentioned, I kind of, it's a talk we had some time back and I was trying to allude to that. This, this, so there will all, there is this connection between Africa, um, the Caribbean, the Latin America and so on. I mean, 
in addition to the contribution of the Caribbean to, to let us um, to socialism in recent in the recent past, let us also remember Haiti, the contribution of the Caribbean to that even the idea of 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 a black run state globally. So there's always been that inspiration, and it will go back and forth depending on the 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 balance of forces that are existing in each territory. Uh, but I do think we are we we are witnessing a an emergence of a new era. And we I want to put that in the context of the failure. We cannot forget the failure of neoliberalism. And that is what is giving us a chance now because people are seeing that neoliberalism that was projected as the ultimate end of history, we realize that no, that too is that was a temporary moment in history and that there's still more to come. There's still, there is alternatives, or there are alternatives, sorry, and that the socialist agenda is a genuine, permanent alternative. And that is crucial for going forward, for not just for, for the Caribbean, not just for Latin America, not just for the Africa, but for humanity as a whole. Thanks, Ozzy. Uh, ben, is there anything you want to comment on these two questions? Um, yeah, maybe just briefly on the on the on the, the last one there. Um, yeah, obviously, as as all you were saying, you know, there's of course endless historical links between the Caribbean and, and Africa, and so um, you know we could spend ages talking about that. But as I was mentioned, you know, Haiti. You know, as I was discussing in my um, presentation there in the paper, you know, there's a consistent focus on events in Africa by the Black Power movement. Um, you know. Yes, on a sort of pan-Africanist sort of racial solidarity basis, but also, as I was saying, because uh, there's a you know really interesting these sort of uh, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, um, socialist struggles, um, and you know, so as, you know, I liked Ozzy's formulation there. You know, there's sort of a, a shifting relationship, a sort of back and forth, and, and that may change over time uh, based on the balance of forces or, or circumstances, and so, um, so that's very interesting. I suppose my kind of uh, you know, uh, thing thing to add here would be, you know, the in the question there it was talked about increasing levels of, I guess, continental solidarity against imperialism in Africa, or a move towards sort of a, a more uh, regionalist approach, regional integration. That sort of chimes with what Francisco was talking to us about earlier with with South America. It would appear to me, and so, you know, if this sort of trend of sort of greater integration or cooperation in the in the global South. Um, you know, in Africa, in, in South America, and, you know, in in the Caribbean, potentially or hopefully, you know, to to sort of stand up for, or you know, to, to try and I don't know, counter force of imperialism, you know, to sort of I don't know, delink perhaps from you know, sort of certain imperialist structures and, and systems um, is something to be commended and, and hopeful for, uh, even if it's early days. Um, and, you know, I think this, you know, speaks to sort of the broader global situation, right? You know, Francisco mentioned multipolarity. Well, you know, it's, it sort of looks like sort of the, the age of U.S. imperial hegemony is perhaps coming to an end or certainly weaker than it has been previously. And so this is, you know, potentially a kind of um, important time or important moment to be building these sort of connections or building mm -hmm. these sort of regional linkages or solidarities, uh, you know, in order to sort of hopefully advance a progressive or, or socialist politics and so yes i don't know that, those are my thoughts there uh now i bring it here but um you know i think there's some nice through lines actually between all all three talks today so yeah thank you ben francisco do you want to add anything um very briefly just to say i subscribe every single word of Ossie's reply on that particular question including the comments um, this is not just an epoch of change, it's a change of epoch. And that's exactly right. So I leave it there because the answer has been fantastic and also what Ben said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a quick question from Paul and Francis and then ask the speakers to come back. We're, we're running out of time a little bit. So, mm -hmm. Paul, do you want to put your question? Okay. First of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, Queen. And a good friend here in Jamaica who joined us, and thanks for asking the question, Queen. Uh, I put a question in the chat for for Ozzy, really. 
And I said, to what extent does the oil field workers union in Trinidad and Tobago have a socialist um, perspective or even understanding? I ask that because to my mind in Jamaica, all of our unions, trade unions, so-called trade unions represent an effective aristocracy of labor. And there's not a great inclination to, to move in that direction. So I was wondering whether the oil field workers are doing any better. Thank you, Paul. Francis, do you want to put your question? Yeah, thanks. This is a, this is a question really uh, for anybody who's currently based, based in the Caribbean. Um, and it concerns, if you like, uh, the English speaking Caribbean and, and, and uh, the current state of socialism and the emergence of, if you like, a kind of global news um, uh, system and the spread of and the spread of social media. Something I've certainly noticed in in in, in the UK, in this country, is that as a result of this, if you like, American ideas are kind of seeping into what used to be socialist discourse in this country, and increasingly because of the simple weight of American uh, media material and that sort of thing, the preoccupations of American liberalism are being taken as being what the you know uh, the, the, the European left should also be interested in. I would imagine, in relation to the Caribbean, this kind of uh, external influence is even is even more weighty. Is it something which you're actually seeing and is it sort of significantly um damaging or possibly even benefiting the way things the, the way things are developing there this kind of uh, kind of cultural cultural hegemony of uh, of the united states even in it even on the left thank you francis um Marcy, do you want to quickly answer paul's question and then uh address what francis is saying <laughs> All right. Yeah, Paul's question is much easier. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the OWTU as a trade union, we go beyond simply negotiating for good collective agreements. And even when we do that, we do that in the context of understanding that collective bargaining is really a class struggle between capital and labor, even when you're negotiating with, state, with the state. We also have the perspective of the transformation of the society itself meaning we and we strive for it which is why we are constantly under attack is because we want to, to fundamentally change the economic relations of power so we not we don't simply accept our role as um, bargaining over the bargaining table but rather we see the entire society it is why we are anti-imperialist. It's why we supported, for example, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa during the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. It's why we have always maintained a strong relationship with Cuba. It's also why we have a strong relationship with Chavez and then Maduro. We are very clear about our political ideology and we are grounded by it and we stand by it. And it's why we strive even politically to bring about these sorts of transformation. Um, Francis' question of cultural hegemony is a really, is a big, is a big question. And I guess, um, yes, it is something that we have to pay very close attention to because that cultural hege hegemony can also lead to the rise of fascism if we are not careful. And whilst we are hopeful of what has happened in, um, in terms of uh, Latin America, we also have to be vigilant and because there's also a counter force that is, that is in a bitter struggle with the movement for change. And that counter force is indeed the, the rise of, of, of right wing fascist tendencies. We cannot for one minute think that Trump may not win the next election. It is possible. Uh, we've seen the rise of the um, in Italy of a base, basically a fascist um, uh, president who was elected, uh, um, and we've seen the rise of of, of rise, uh, fascist tendency in France and so on, and in, in, and all across. So it, I just want to end by uh, saying that it is a continuous struggle, and that even though we have made some victories those victories can be snuffed out if we are not vigilant to defend it. We should have been vigilant in 1983. 
we should have consolidated ourselves and defended the Grenadian Revolution. We didn't. We didn't. And I'm just saying that the progress we have made cannot be taken for granted. We have to be continuously vigilant to defend it. Thanks, Ozzy. Um, ben, do you want to come back on anything? Um, well, <laughs> on France's question, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the contemporary commentary for people, you know, actually living in the Caribbean. Um, but I suppose just on this, I guess, topic of cultural hegemony and, uh, you know, the US in relation to the Caribbean, right, we can see the emergence of the Black Power movement is sort of in, in many senses, I guess. Well, certainly it's presentation, it's sort of aesthetics and slogans is sort of a product of US cultural hegemony uh, in the Caribbean in a way, right? You know, because it was, you know, things like the US Black Panther Party, um, you know, the key figures within that, um, who were very prominent in Black Power uh, organization activism. Um, you know, as I said, the aesthetics, the sort of slogans, um, you know, the sort of militant style of dress and all this, you know, these, these, these were sort of things that had an effect on West Indian uh, articulation of black power, um, even, you know, the term black power, right? Um, you know, coined by Stoker Carmichael, who was, you know, originally born in Trinidad, but, you know, in the context of the Black Panther Party in the United States. Um, and so in that sense, you know, <laughs> I, I'd like to think, or, you know, I, I think it is the case that, you know, the black power movement and uh, black power politics was a progressive force uh, in the West Indies um, in the Caribbean. And, you know, it sort of has in, in no insignificant way roots in, I guess, US cultural hegemony in a sense. Although, admittedly, well, I guess that well, it, these weren't the liberal pretensions uh, that were being transmitted there. But I guess it was sort of liberal fears in the United States that were being transmitted uh, about this sort of thing. Uh, but I guess sort of was the undercurrent there. But anyway, uh, that's my my comment on that. As I said, I'll leave the contemporary commentary to to people actually based in the Caribbean. So. I, I just want to say, Nadine, I really don't think I properly addressed Francis' question. It is a big question. Um, and it's something to reflect on, to, to, you know, the whole question of social media and uh, this question of cultural hegemony. U.S. Uh, attempt to impose its own idea of even freedom and liberation again on the Caribbean society is a, is a big one. Um, so maybe it's, it's worth another publication of Socialist History Society. Sorry about that. Anybody else want to come in, Francisco? Anybody else? Um, just, I think the crucial battle is political. Um, I think it is possible that they have, I wouldn't say cultural hegemony, although that's a reality, but they have hegemony over the media, which is similar but not identical. And in Latin America, certainly, even in the Caribbean, I think we've been able to make significant, have significant victories, significant gains, even though they have this massive control. I think the crucial question for me is when it comes to any gain you make, and you have to be vigilant and so on, the crucial question is not, only, it's not so much the narrative, although that is important, but it's how you are able to organize people in committees, in self-organized institutions that actually are you know, central to the stake of what is being fought about. Unless you organize the masses and they are active and play a protagonic role, then I think the possibility of just concentrating, I'm not suggesting that anybody said that, but that you're going to be able to resolve the threat by just being able to sort out the cultural hegemony issue without that, that political dimension is, is, is a problem, it seems to me. And just um, to say I've seen the, the, um, the chat, 
Um, it is true. I'm pretty totally guilty that we didn't talk about women at all, which is a real you know, shame. But just to say that most of the 845, 48,000 grassroots committees that exist in Venezuela, 80% of them are run by women. And the in Nicaragua is has been number five in the world in terms of bridging the gap gender. I mean, it's, it's close to Norway and this sort of thing. So there is plenty that has been done and is being done already in Cuba, you know, has more women in all sorts of positions at every level of society. And that's what socialism does. And it is, it's a shame that we haven't mentioned that. So I apologize for not having done it, but it is taking place. Thank you. Um, Joseph, do you want to come in briefly? We're going to have to finish it at four and then Steve. Yes, um, I, in terms of the cultural hegemony, I'm particularly concerned of how we've been fed the narrative of the West, uh, the global West, uh, especially in relation to uh, position on the conflict with Ukraine and, and the United States. I mean, with Ukraine and uh, with Russia and, and, and NATO, uh, because most of the information that the average person picks up and internalize is what is fed by the BBC, CNN, Fox, and there are all other alternative information. Yet at the same time, that's where I want to come in. Some of the alternative information that comes in, although it's, uh, it's highly, uh, greatly factual, but it is from a Trumpite. You can see, if you know how to read through the lines, you can see a Trump or, or, or conservative trend in it. Okay, we are against the war in Ukraine. Uh, 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 NATO's uh, involvement, but I mean, Trump is the solution, that kind of stuff. So unless you're able to read through the lines, you can end up, you know, finding yourself being, I mean, uh, a supporter or, or being washed away in that kind of uh, hegemony. I hope I'm clear enough. And I want to support uh, Marshall's point in terms of gender. Thank you. He's American. Um, Steve, do you want to have the word, last words? Yeah, uh, just to say that uh, on Marsha's point about the, uh, uh, the role of women, uh, social, uh, Caribbean Labour Solidarity published uh, about six months ago a pamphlet by Marsha and Luke on that very question. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that we keep these things separately, uh, of course, but what I am saying is that we, we did publish that. Uh, I would recommend that people reread it now in the light of what other people are saying. What I shall do is uh, when I circulate the details of the, uh, the, the recording at the end, which I always do, uh, I'll put a link onto that so that people can actually download that and uh, read it again, because it's well worth reading. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Steve, and thanks to all the speakers this afternoon and all the people who contributed or, or just listened. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, and I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you. I thank you, comrades. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.